Hollywood Murder, The Case of William Desmond Taylor, 1922. William Desmond Taylor was sitting at his desk preparing his income tax returns for the year 1921. He had just finished editing The Green Temptation, a Paris melodrama starring Betty Compson and Theodore Kosloff. His partially finished statement showed that he had earned $37,000 that year. His valet, Henry Peavy, entered the living room to tell him that supper was served. Taylor got up from his desk and went to the table to eat. Taylor was a successful film actor and director. After appearing in several silent films, he had made his directorial debut in 1914 with The Awakening. He directed more than 40 films over the next seven years, including Davy Crockett, Tom Sawyer, Huckleberry Finn, The Green Temptation, and End of the Green Gables. He worked with such acting greats as Mary Pickford, Dustin Farnham, Wallace Reed, and Mary Miles Mentor. He was also president of the Motion Picture Directors Association. Taylor lived in a white bungalow duplex in the exclusive Alvarado Court Apartments on South Alvarado Street in Los Angeles. This housing complex had 16 apartments arranged in eight two-story white stucco buildings overlooking Westlake Park. The bungalows were built side by side with their front doors facing a walkway or driveway rather than the street. Most of Taylor's neighbors were colleagues who also worked in the film industry. Charlie Chaplin's leading lady at the time, Edna Purviance, lived in the building immediately to the west of Taylor. Director Charles Maine lived in the adjoining bungalow at 404A. On his other side, separated by an eight-foot parkway, lived film comedian Douglas McLean and his wife Faith. Taylor's five-room apartment was furnished with exquisite taste. Taylor was a cultured, dignified man who was well-liked by his peers. The living room wall was a solid border of autographed and framed photos. A picture of Mary Pickford bore the inscription, To my nice director, William Desmond Taylor, the most patient man I have ever known. Mary Pickford. On the piano was another photo inscribed. For William Desmond Taylor, artist, gentleman, man. Sincere good wishes, Mary Miles Minter, 1920. There were also several framed photos of actress Mabel Normand. The popular director sat down to eat what would be his last supper on February 1, 1922. Once the meal was finished, Taylor rose from the table and went to make a telephone call to one of his closest friends, Spanish romantic movie star Antonio Moreno. Peavy the valet busied himself tidying up the dishes. At 6.45 p.m., the chauffeur of glamorous silent film star Mabel Normand pulled up to Taylor's bungalow. Norman had spent the afternoon with her chauffeur William Davis in the shopping district of Los Angeles. At 6 p.m. she went to the Hellman Bank at the corner of 6th and Main Streets to place some valuable Christmas gifts in her safety deposit box. Then she phoned home, where her maid said that Taylor had been trying to reach her all afternoon. He said that he had a good book for her that he wanted her to stop in and pick up. On her way to Taylor's home, she stopped at 7th and Broadway Streets to buy some peanuts and a number of magazines, including a copy of the Police Gazette. She needed to have new photos taken for the movie studio, and she was inspired by the pose of the young woman on the cover. She ate peanuts in the back seat of her car and tossed the shells on the floor. As she emerged from the vehicle to walk up to Taylor's door, she told her chauffeur to clean up the car. PV answered the door and told her that Taylor was on the phone. Not wanting to interrupt her friend, Norman waited outside on the front step. When Taylor finished his phone call, Norman stepped inside and visited with the director for about 35 minutes. Peavy mixed them orange blossom cocktails, gin and orange juice, which they enjoyed as they sat on the Davenport in the living room chatting. Having finished work for the day, Peavy left the house at about 7.30 p.m. and stopped to visit outside with Norman's chauffeur before heading home for the night. Taylor gave Norman the book that he had set aside for her. The two emerged from the bungalow at about 7.45 p.m., soon after Peavy's departure. Taylor escorted Norman to her car. She would be the last person to see him alive. At about 7.55 p.m., Taylor's chauffeur Howard Fellows tried to phone Taylor. There was no answer. Fellows was driving Taylor's car and had been told to call him that evening. He went to Taylor's bungalow and rang the doorbell at 8.15 p.m. to return the car keys as instructed. 
The lights were on in the house, but there was no answer. He put Taylor's McFarlane vehicle away and went home. Edna Perviance returned home at about midnight and noticed a light on in Taylor's bungalow, but she decided not to disturb her neighbor. Henry Peavy arrived at the Taylor residence the next morning, February 2, 1922, at 7.30 a.m. to start work. Oddly, the bedroom was dark and only the downstairs light was on. His first task was to make breakfast. He had stopped by a drugstore on his way to work to buy a bottle of milk of magnesia for Taylor. At Taylor's house, he picked up the newspaper that was resting on the front doorstep, inserted the key in the lock, pushed open the door, and let out a piercing shriek. The furniture in the house was in the same place as it had been when he left the night before. Two empty cocktail glasses stood on the table. But Taylor's body lay stretched out on the living room floor near his writing desk. He was lying on his back with his feet toward the door and a chair was resting over one of his legs. He was fully dressed in a vest, coat, collar, and tie. His clothes weren't rumpled and his arms lay straight at his sides. A checkbook was open on the desk in the living room, a pen resting nearby. Frightened by the discovery of his employer's body, Peavy ran back outside screaming that Taylor was dead. Bungalow owner E. C. Gisarum emerged from his home dressed in a housecoat. He was the first person to enter his tenant's house, followed by Charles Maine and Douglas McLean. Within moments, tenants of nearby bungalows began swarming into the apartment and milling around the body. Detective Lt. Tom Ziegler was the first police officer to arrive on the scene just before 8 a.m. He was careful not to touch the body, and he ordered everyone to leave the house. Without moving the body, a doctor in the crowd stepped forward and conducted a cursory examination. He concluded that Taylor had died of natural causes, possibly heart trouble or a stomach hemorrhage. Charles Ayton, general manager of Famous Players Lasky Corporation, a subsidiary of Paramount Pictures, arrived while Ziegler waited for the coroner. He immediately went upstairs to Taylor's bedroom and collected some of the victim's letters and personal belongings. Ziegler did not stop him. He knew Ayton personally and understood that the studio executive had been a friend of Taylor's. Ayton subsequently destroyed the letters. When later asked why, he said that they were letters from married women, and he was trying to protect Taylor's name from being dragged into a scandal. When Ayton came back downstairs, he walked over to where the body lay and began talking to Ziegler. He didn't believe that Taylor had died of natural causes. Deputy Coroner William McDonald arrived at about 8.30 a.m. He slid his hand under Taylor's body. When he pulled it out, he found blood. He and Aiton turned over the body and discovered that Taylor had been lying in a pool of blood. Aiton opened Taylor's vest and noticed a hole on the left side. He and McDonald pulled up the shirt and vest and found the wound. Ziegler phoned the homicide squad immediately. Clearly, Taylor's death was no accident. Investigators H. H. Klein, Ray Cato, Wiley Murphy, Billy Kale and Jesse A. Wynn arrived and discovered that Taylor had been shot at close range with a .38 caliber revolver, likely a Smith & Wesson. The bullet was unusual, it was old and the design was no longer used, but it had entered through Taylor's left side and traveled upward until it lodged in the right side of his neck just under the skin. There was also something odd about the crime scene. The body appeared to have been neatly posed, and the clothes were not rumpled. The bullet holes in Taylor's coat and vest did not match up with one another. When Taylor's arms were at his sides, as he was found, the hole in the coat was significantly lower than the one in the vest. The two holes only matched up when the left elbow was raised. Someone had rearranged the body post-mortem. Police initially believed that Taylor had been held up and his hands were raised in the air at the time that he was shot. Taylor had gone to Europe during the summer of 1921 leaving his home in the care of Edward F. Sands, his cook and valet. When he returned, he discovered that Sands had left a week earlier, around July 15, 1921. Taylor told police that Sands had stolen more than $2,400 by forging checks and taking jewelry, clothing, and a car. Police later discovered that Sands had used multiple aliases over the years and had left a trail of embezzlement, forgery, and desertion charges in his wake.
Nearly five months later, on December 4, 1921, Sands burglarized Taylor's apartment. The back door was smashed in, and his home was ransacked. Sands stole jewelry and special cigarettes, and a man later identified as Sands pawned some of Taylor's stolen jewelry for $20 at the Capital Jewelry and Loan Company in Fresno, California. Experts later declared that the handwriting on the pawn tickets matched that of Sands. However, the theory that Taylor was killed during another holdup two months after Sands ransacked his apartment quickly failed to add up. Police found $78 in cash in Taylor's pocket, a two-carat diamond ring on his finger, and a platinum watch on his body. The watch had stopped at 721. A jeweler ruled three weeks later that the watch had stopped when it wound down, not because of Taylor's fall. Robbery was eliminated as a motive. Police fixed Taylor's time of death as being between 7.40 p.m. and 8.15 p.m. They found a small pile of cigarette stubs at the back of his bungalow, suggesting that someone had waited there for an opportunity to get inside Taylor's apartment. Perhaps the intruder entered when Taylor stepped outside to escort Norman to her car. But who was it? Sometime between 8 p.m. and 8.15 p.m. the night of the murder, Faith McLean, wife of actor Douglas McLean, had heard a gunshot from next door after supper. She and her husband lived in the bungalow beside Taylor's. She walked to the door of her home, and in the light coming from Taylor's bungalow, she saw someone emerge from his house. The person was wearing a heavy coat of the Mackinac type, a cap, and a muffler around their neck. It was a funny-looking man, she later said. The person she saw paused on Taylor's porch and looked back towards the half-open door as though someone inside had said something. Then the person calmly closed the door of Taylor's apartment and faced Mrs. McLean as he came down the steps and walked leisurely towards the street. McLean then assumed that what she had heard was the sound of a passing vehicle backfire, not a gunshot. Stories of Taylor's murder and possible leads, both real and imagined, were splashed all over the newspapers. In some reports, a streetcar conductor claimed to have seen a man who fit the description that Mrs. McLean had given. According to that particular story, the man was seen boarding a car on Maryland Street at either 7.54 or 8.27 p.m. the night of the murder. Another man insisted that shortly before the murder, someone stopped him on the street and asked for a fictitious address and then asked where Taylor lived. He gave the man the information that was requested. According to another report, two men at a service station said that a man fitting the description asked them shortly before 6 p.m. where Taylor lived and the men told him. The identity of the man, whom McLean later said could have actually been a woman dressed as a man, was not the case's only mystery. With his murder, Taylor's true identity was finally unmasked. To his friends. William Desmond Taylor was really William Cunningham Dean Tanner. He was born in Carlow, County Carlow, Ireland, 56 miles from Dublin, on April 26, 1872. He came to the United States in 1890. Eighteen years later, he ran a New York business whose share of the profits amounted to a cool $25,000 a year, a considerable amount of money at the time. He had married Ethel May Harrison in 1901, had a young daughter named Ethel Daisy, and enjoyed a successful business and promising future. One day in the fall of 1908, Taylor went to New York after attending the Vanderbilt Cup race, took $500 from his business, and disappeared. The next few years of his life remained shrouded in mystery until he appeared in Hollywood as William Desmond Taylor and quickly climbed the ladder to become a respected director. Taylor's wife learned about her husband's new identity when she and her daughter attended a film in which Taylor's image was flashed across the screen. His daughter apparently found his address and wrote to him. They exchanged letters and he saw her on his return from a trip to Europe in the summer of 1921. By then, his wife had divorced him and remarried. The investigation into Taylor's murder was headed by District Attorney Thomas Lee Woolwine. He believed that the motive for the murder was either retaliation or revenge. On the morning of February 3, 1922, he handed to Special Investigator Ed C. King an anonymous letter written in a woman's handwriting. The author of the letter claimed that if they searched the basement in Mabel Norman's apartment carefully, they would find the murder weapon, a .38 caliber pearl-handled revolver. King, Lieutenants Wynne, Murphy, 
and Klein searched the apartment thoroughly, from the cellar to the attic. They found 2.25 caliber revolvers in the dresser drawer of Norman's bedroom, but neither had any connection with the murder and no other gun was found. Six days after Taylor's murder, District Attorney Woolwine issued an arrest warrant for Sands on charges of theft and grand larceny. He was described as being about 26 years old, 5 feet 7 inches, light complexion, heavy build, straight brown hair, and a cigarette smoker. Police called for Sands to step forward and clear his name, but he was never found. By March 6, 1922, a month after the murder, more than 300 people had claimed to have killed Taylor, including one confession from someone in Paris and another from a person in England, but detectives were no closer to solving Taylor's murder. Mabel Normand was interviewed by police, but she was quickly discounted as a possible suspect. Who else could want him dead? Police continued searching Taylor's house for clues. While opening a book in his library, a letter fell out. The crest bore the initials M, 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 and the letter read, Dearest, I love you. I love you. I love you, followed by several cross marks and one big cross mark. It was signed, Yours Always, Mary, and was from Mary Miles Minter. Fueled by her mother's ambition, Minter had begun acting when she was barely five years old. Theater led to films, and in 1918 her mother and manager Charlotte Shelby negotiated a deal with film studio Paramount to pay Minter $1.3 million for 20 films over five years. In April 1923, Minter would turn 21 and no longer be under her mother's legal control. The young actress, who was two months shy of her 20th birthday, had been deeply in love with the 49-year-old Taylor and was a frequent visitor to his apartment. Actor Carl Stockdale phoned Charlotte Shelby to tell her that Taylor was dead. At about 11 a.m. February 2, 1922, Shelby went to Minter's room. Minter was getting dressed and fixing her hair when Shelby pounded on the door and announced the news. Minter was devastated. A handkerchief belonging to Minter was found in Taylor's apartment after his death. Detectives also collected three long, blonde hairs from under the collar of his coat. An expert compared them with combings retrieved from Minter's dressing room and noted that they matched. These hairs were placed in an envelope and left with the property clerk at the central police station for safekeeping. The district attorney questioned Minter, but she contributed no new information to the investigation. Detectives went to see Charlotte Shelby at her home to find out what she knew about Taylor and the murder. Shelby arrived at the door fastening her dress and announced that she was getting ready to take the 6 p.m. train to New York. She told the detectives that she had no time to speak to them about an investigation about which she had no information to add. She directed them to address questions to her lawyers, Mr. Mott and Mr. Castle, who were in her house for that reason. Special Investigator King learned from Shelby's mother, Julia Miles, that Shelby had spent the day of the murder shopping, the early evening visiting friends, and returned home at about 9 p.m. Theories were also put forward that Taylor's death was related to a drug ring. He wasn't an addict, but some of his friends, including several women, were known to be addicted. Tom Green, assistant U.S. attorney in charge of drug prosecutions, stated that Taylor had appealed to him for help to get rid of the dope ring that was supplying drugs to a certain actress. At that time, according to Taylor, this actress was paying about $2,000 a week for drugs. Harry Young, who used the alias Harry Lee, was in Los Angeles at the time of the Taylor murder. When he was arrested, police questioned Young, but he denied killing Taylor and he was released after three days. District Attorney Woolwine was a close personal friend of both Minter and Shelby. While King was trying to interview Shelby, District Attorney Woolwine ordered that evidence in the case be transferred from the police station to his office and placed in a cabinet. This evidence later disappeared. Everything except Taylor's coat and vest were later taken to Woolwine's home. Woolwine passed away in 1923 and was succeeded by Asa Keys. Drama surrounding the case continued to unfold. In August 1923, less than four months after reaching the age of majority, Mary Miles Minter announced plans to bring court action against her mother. She wanted to try to take possession of the fortune that she had made while working in films. She said that she had earned more than $1 million, and her mother handled all of her money. 
She told reporters, I have been the wage earner, the family meal ticket ever since I was five years old. I wasn't given a chance to get more than three or four years of actual schooling. Mother was ambitious socially and financially, and I had to turn beauty and talents into cash. Minter claimed that her last contract had called for her to be paid $1.3 million. When her mother showed her the figures, $175,000 was credited to Shelby and $165,000 to Minter. Household expenses, for Shelby and daughters Margaret and Mary, had been deducted from Minter's share. For her part, Shelby claimed that Minter wasn't able to manage her own finances. Minter told the media that she had hoped she and Taylor would eventually marry, and she said that she was told not to talk about it when Taylor died because it would hurt her career. Soon after the revelation, Shelby agreed to compromise with her daughter on financial matters, and the issue disappeared from the pages of newspapers. The investigation into Taylor's murder continued to limp along under the direction of Asa Keys. Written statements from several people associated with Minter's family were not taken in the months following Taylor's murder, despite the fact that Shelby had openly threatened to kill Taylor. Shelby was jealous of any attention that men paid to her daughter, and she had threatened to kill others, including actor Monty Blue and actor-slash-director James Kirkwood. She had repeatedly threatened to murder Taylor if he continued paying attention to Minter. Minter was a highly paid actress, and Shelby needed to maintain control of her daughter and her daughter's earnings. Charlotte Whitney, Shelby's secretary, made a statement to Keyes on November 25, 1925, and then again to his successor in 1937. She said that she was present when Shelby threatened to kill Taylor. Shelby phoned Whitney and chauffeur Chauncey Eaton at about midnight one night when she was looking for Minter. They drove to Taylor's home. Shelby hid a loaded revolver in the sleeve of her coat, entered Taylor's home to search the apartment, but her daughter wasn't there. Shelby angrily told Taylor she would have killed him had she found Minter in his apartment. According to Whitney, the day before Taylor was found murdered Minter said that she and Taylor had a date to drive to Santa Ana. Shelby overheard the conversation and locked Minter in her room to prevent her from going. Shelby was also said to own a .38 caliber revolver believed to have been a Smith & Wesson. Keyes took the first written statement from Shelby on April 9, 1926, in the presence of her lawyer John G. Mott. She claimed that on the night of Taylor's murder, she had spent two hours at home from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. having milk and sandwiches with friend and actor Carl Stockdale. Baron Fitz, who succeeded Keyes, continued to investigate. He interviewed Shelby's chauffeur, Chauncey Eaton, on November 25, 1929. Eaton said that Shelby phoned him the morning that Taylor's body was found. She announced that Taylor had been murdered and wanted him to come to work right away. He didn't have time to finish his breakfast. Shelby's friend Miss J. M. Berger had already told police that Shelby called her at 7 p.m. on February 1, 1922, and asked if she knew where Minter was. Berger said that she did not, and Shelby hung up. The next morning, Shelby told Berger and Eaton at or just before 7.30 a.m. that Taylor had been murdered, but his body wasn't discovered until 7.30 a.m. and the fact that he had been murdered wasn't confirmed until 8 a.m. The case lay dormant again until 1937. In a statement made on May 5, 1937, Minter's older sister Margaret Fillmore said that in her previous statements in 1926 she had tried to cover up for her mother about Taylor's murder. She said that on the night of February 1, 1922, Shelby had locked Minter in her room because she was afraid her daughter would run away with Taylor. Fillmore said that her mother gave conflicting stories of her whereabouts the night of the Taylor murder. Shelby told her family that on the night of February 1st, she took a taxi at about 6 p.m. and went to the Swedish eucalyptus bathhouse north of Hollywood Boulevard, but the doctor who ran the bathhouse had no record of Shelby being there that night. The following morning, Carl Stockdale phoned Shelby and told her that Taylor had been murdered, shot with a bullet fired from a .38 caliber Smith & Wesson revolver, the same type of gun Shelby owned. Soon after, she asked her chauffeur Chauncey Eaton to remove the loaded cartridges and destroy all of them. Instead, he had a cartridge on a beam in the basement of her home, which is where investigators found it on May 23, 1937. 
it was the same type and weight as the bullet that had killed Taylor. Fillmore said her grandmother, Julia Miles, disposed of the gun by throwing it in a bayou near her Louisiana plantation in August 1922. In the meantime, Shelby had appeared before the Los Angeles County Grand Jury on May 6, 1937, proclaiming her innocence. Carl Stockdale testified in support of her alibi, which was accepted. District Attorney Baron Fitz officially closed the investigation into the Taylor murder on September 29, 1938. It would be reopened if any new evidence were uncovered, but in a case that appeared to be plagued by corruption and poor management of the crime scene, none ever was. An estimated 10,000 people lined the streets of Hollywood for Taylor's funeral on February 7, 1922, at St. Paul's Pro Cathedral. He was buried in a crypt in Hollywood Memorial Park Cemetery, perhaps the only other person besides his killer to know what really happened on February 1, 1922. Mabel Norman died of tuberculosis in the Pottinger Sanatorium at Monrovia, California, on February 23, 1930. Mary Miles Mentor died in 1984. Most of the films that Taylor left behind have been lost.